service this morning. And we especially want to welcome Eden Church, um, who's joining us for the joint retreat. We welcome you and we pray that you'd be blessed. Um, if we can just bow our heads in prayer as we prepare for worship.
Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word.
reciting the Apostles' Creed together this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Take a minute or so to greet one another this morning and say hello. Uh, as Jimmy mentioned, welcome uh, everybody this morning to our Sunday service, especially welcome to our friends from Eden. Uh, it's great to worship together. Um, before I just share a couple of announcements, th that's the whole, I guess, word that's been running through my mind over the last several days listening to uh, Pastor Billy share, but also spending time with our friends from Eden is the idea of partnerships. Uh, Pastor Billy talked about Timothy and Paul's partnership for the gospel yesterday. Uh, and for us, you know, even though we're here and then you know, less than a mile down the street, we have Eden. Um, you know, we're not separate entities in a sense, that we're together. We're local churches joined by uh, the blood of Christ and we are co-laborers, partners in the gospel. And so we're grateful to do, be able to realize that we're not alone in doing this. And so it's such a blessing to worship together and, and uh, do things together and we look forward to doing more things. And so... Uh, welcome this morning. Several announcements. Uh, this week our, our pre-K VBS uh, starts, and so if you need more information, there is a QR code in the back. You can find it there in the back or on our website or social media accounts. Uh, next week is our K through 5 VBS, so if you haven't signed up already, please do so. And then the last announcement that I have is Friday, August uh, 5th at 7 p.m., 7 p.m., I think, uh, there is a college uh, workshop, so college and career workshop for those students who are in college or high school seniors or juniors. Uh, we have a great panel of working professionals and people in our community that just want to spend some time with you and get to know you and really provide any kind of insight or help or help answer questions. So uh, fields, health profession fields, uh, business, entrepreneurship, um, a lot of different fields there represented. And so uh, if you are a college student or if you want more information, uh, please uh, check out our, our website. Uh, and you can find it there. But that's Friday, uh, August 5th at 7 p.m. Um, as we move toward the message this morning, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Reverend Billy uh, Park this morning. He comes all the way from uh, Suwanee, Georgia, and uh, he's been so gracious to share his life with us over the last couple of days. And we look forward to hearing uh, the message this morning entitled, uh, Exploring What It Means to Be uh, the Church in the Korean American Context from Acts chapter 17. And so, as Reverend Billy makes his way up here, let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure for me to be here um, the Friday and yesterday and today and to be with God's people everywhere. It's always good. And so it's good to see what the Lord is doing here in Portland. And... Um, I'm going to be staying until Tuesday morning or afternoon, and so I'm going to enjoy some of what uh, Portland has to show me and some of the friends are showing me. Uh, tomorrow night, actually, I think there's some volleyball thing that's going on, and I'll be participating in that as well. I don't know. One of the things in my life, uh, I have a great love for sports, and uh, I'm a pastor, but I also coach uh, at a Christian academy for volleyball, and so that's some uh, very a big interest of mine. So if you want to come out and uh, learn how to play volleyball, I could actually give you a free lesson. <laughs> um, anyway, today's message is called Exploring What It Means to Be the Church in the Korean American Context. And originally I had uh, planned uh, this message as um, it's really a fairly long message and that included both uh, Korean church history so that was under the theme of the leg knowing our legacy, understanding Korean church history, and then going into knowing our situation and delving into some of the more 
over the last few decades at some of the development within Korean American or English speaking ministry. And so I've chosen actually to focus on the Korean church history. So this title might be misleading because it's almost like you can say it's, it has a lot to do with um, understanding the Korean church. And I know uh, many of you are not Korean, as uh, I, you know, I'm sure both churches welcome you. And this, uh, but as you know, if when you walk in here, there's, it's a Korean church. In one sense, every church is not any ethnic church. It's a church for all people. Churches are for all people. But a Korean church has a distinctive history. Why it has that particularity? Because. It's an immigrant church. It's, it was born out of the immigrant tradition. And so knowing its history is very important to know how to assess our current situation. And so I will not be speaking a lot about our current situation, which might be more fitting to our title, but I'm actually going to be speaking more about our legacy. So from Acts 17, 24 to 28, and I'm not... Um, you know, it's usually my pattern just to go, th go through almost verse by verse and just exposit the scriptures, and that should be the normal case within a Sunday worship service. Um, but today, I'm really using this text to highlight something uh, that shows you that um, human particularities, human history, history of nations, immigrant history is actually a very important part of what God is doing because God is a sovereign God. And if you look at Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 28a, or the first part of 28, and let me read it for you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by, by man, nor is he, serving, is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him, and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of you, for in him we live and move and have our being. And this is Paul speaking at Athens, where he's faced with all the idolatry, all the temples of the Greek pantheon of gods, and he saw the, uh, a place even for the unknown god, the statue, and he was pointing to them that you know, you worship idols, and he could have spent a lot of time rebuking them because he was indeed grieved by the idolatry, but he tried to make a connection with them that in the midst of their culture, and he wasn't trying to say their culture was good or, nor bad necessarily, but to say that in your culture that God is meeting you. There are even signs, even in your own culture, you have a... a a, a, a place for the unknown God, and that which you do not know, here I am proclaiming to you, the God of the universe, who you do not know. So the God of Israel, one of the testimony of the Old Testament, and many of the Psalms portray this, the Lord, Yahweh, or the old, old way of saying it was Jehovah, you know, that, that's scholars sort of determine how you're supposed to say it because the word in the, in the original is uh, four consonants without a vowel because it was a name that you were not supposed to pronounce. So the, the Hebrews would never say the name of God, which is the I am, but they would say the word Adonai, which means Lord. That's where we get in the, in the English Bible, wherever you see uh, Yahweh, you actually see Lord, capital L-O-R-D. And Yahweh was the personal covenant God of Israel. And the God of Israel was their God. So if I was a Jew, he is my God. 
But the testimony of the Bible is the God of Israel is the God of the universe. And the God of the universe is my God. A personal relationship, yet not merely experiential. Something bigger than yourself. So if you say the God of the Koreans, if he's not the God of the universe, then we are worshiping a false God. God is sovereign. He is the Lord of the universe. He made everything. The one who made everything is my God. He meets me personally. He gives everything to mankind, life and breath and everything. He directs the course of mankind that every nation on earth, their boundaries, where they dwell, where they live, is not just determined by economic factors or wars and different things that on the those influenced that Korean War pushed a lot of Koreans out of Korea into the United States because of poverty after the Korean War. So things happen in life that push people to live in one place or not another. But God has a purpose for every nation on earth. And I'm speaking about the Korean church, not to say the Korean church, yay, great Korean church. You know, if anything, a, a lot of Korean Americans, one of the common issues is like, we have a problem with the Korean church. <laughs> you know, a lot of Korean pastors, I've been to a lot of pastors, Korean pastors, Korean American second generation English speaking pastors, gatherings, and to be honest, we spend a lot of time complaining about the Korean church. It's like com complaining about your parents. <laughs> And that's why I actually wanted to start with knowing our legacy, not because I want to just lift up the Koreans or lift up the Korean church, but this is a beautiful story in God's history, in the history of Christianity that is often not known well and not told well. Okay, let's see. Can you go to the next slide? So, I made a little timeline, you know. Um, so, um, again, this is entitled Knowing Our Legacy. So, in 1770, the Catholics were there first. So, there was a Korean envoy to China who went on a diplomatic mission to China and Christianity had, had been in China and then, uh, or the Catholics were in China and that there were some Catholic books. And so this envoy brought back Catholic books. I think he became converted and there was thousands of Catholics believing in Catholicism through these books and through, the, through this new religion that was coming in. But in 1800s, in the early 1800s to mid 1800s, the Korean, uh, uh, leaders of the Korean society, some of the tribal leaders and different places, they saw this as a foreign religion that was, would destroy Korean culture. And so what they did is they annihilated the Catholics. That there are over 8,000, according to the Catholic Church, there's over 8,000 Korean Catholics that were killed. They were known as the, the martyrs. And if you know some Korean ch Catholic churches, they sometimes call themselves the martyr church, remembering this story. But I'm a Protestant, and so the first Protestant missionary, you can say he was 18, in 1866, a, a man named Germain, Robert Germain Thomas. And I put that little cartoon thing that there's a video series called The Torchlighters that have, uh, that speak about heroes of the faith, and I must tell you, it's probably for older children and not younger children, because a lot of the heroes of the faith, they experience some gruesome things, like getting killed, and so it's not necessarily for young children, but if you have a little older children, it's actually good to uh, watch, and you can find them. If you have Amazon Prime, these are actually free on Amazon Prime, the Torchlighter series, and the Robert Germain Thomas story, and you can see it pictured there, and so this young man went to China 
And he was in China, and he was very good linguist, and so he uh, learned the Chinese language, he learned the Korean language, but uh, his, his actually, he was a young 20-something, young 20s, he, got, he was married, they were, had a vision to like win the world for Christ, and they went to China, and they were utterly devastated. His wife died, he was crushed, he ended up giving up his mission and going to work for uh, like kind of a trade exchange because his language was good, so he worked for this trade company. And then he met two Koreans, two Koreans who had been influenced by the Catholics, and they wanted to get a, Catholic, a Bible. And so he was able to get a Bible to them, and he was rejuvenated in his faith. And in 1965, he made a trip to Korea to smuggle Bibles. He was a Bible smuggler. He smuggled Bibles into Korea in 19, eight, uh, 16, 1865, and then in 1866, on his second or third trip to Korea, he was on this boat, uh, but these, these captains uh, on the boat wanted to sort of uh, force their hand for trade in Korea, but the Korean people basically burned down this Western ship that he was on. He was there just to pass out Bibles. So all the creative Bibles burnt up, and he tried to throw them into the sea so it would be preserved from the fire. He got jumped out of the sea, and with one Bible, wet Bible in his hand, he clutched, and he came and tried to pass it out to whoever was there, and he was executed on the shore of Korea, Robert Germain Thomas. I went to a Korean missionary center, and there's a picture of him, that black and white picture, but the picture is drawn with grains of wheat. Because in the Bible it says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, when the grain of wheat dies and falls to the ground, it, it bears a harvest. And so he was, in a sense, the first missionary and the first seed where um, it was implanted. And, and I can go on and on about some of these stories, but um, his testimony, which seemed to die on the shores of Korea, that Bible that was wet, somebody, some, one of the, the, the regional leaders took it, and it was in Chinese. This Bible was in Chinese. He liked the writing, and so he used the Bible as wallpaper <laughs> in his home. <laughs> and he put the Bible on his wall not really even knowing what it was. And there were other people who came and read the Bible. And that actually caused a few people to become Christians. So, it's, uh, you know, that was the first seed of what happened. Okay, next slide. It, but if you were to say, when did Christianity come into Korea? Most people date either 1884 or 1885 officially. So in 1884, there was a, a doctor named Dr. Horace Allen. He was a medical doctor who was working for the uh, U.S. diplomatic. They were trying to build relationship in Korea, a diplomatic relationship. And so while he was there, there was a riot, and the royal family uh, was attacked, part of the royal family, and this one of these princes got stabbed, and he was you know, he looked like he would die, and Dr. Horace Allen was able to treat this prince, and the prince recovered, and the royal family became very grateful. So Korea, with the history of killing Christians, from this point on, the royal family gave favor to Christians because of this providential act. And so from this point, missionaries, at least from the royal family, they were beginning to be welcomed so in 1885, two missionaries, one Presbyterian and one Methodist, and this is one of the reasons why you have a lot of Presbyterian, Koreans are Presbyterians as Southerners are to Baptists. You know, that's what I say in Atlanta, because uh, there are more Korean Presbyterians than there are Scottish Presbyterians, where Presbyterianism came out of Scotland, but the largest Korean denomination, Presbyterian denomination is in Korea. The largest Presbyterian church is in Korea. And Henry Appenzeller, Methodist. So these two 
decided not to compete with each other, but cooperate with each other. So they actually, even though they were from different denominations, they decided, we don't want to say who was first. So they took the same boat, the same ship, and they arrived on the same day, Easter Sunday, April in 1885. And they decided, if you go this way, we go this way. So they sort of divided up their field so they would not conflict with each other, but they would cooperate with each other. Another important date is 1903. 1903 is, uh, is the, known as the first immigra immigration, uh, Korean immigration to the United States. So we live in the United States. And so the, in um, 1903, January 13, 1903, on the SS Gaelic, the ship, 103 um, sugar plantation workers came to Hawaii. And out of the 103, one-third of those people were Christians. When the Korean Christian population was like less than 1%. Uh, so obviously, America was seen as a Christian nation, and so the mo more likely people to go to the United States were Christians. And so the first Korean church, you can say the first Korean church in America was established in Hawaii with these people, plantation workers. And that's not the picture on the bottom there, but the picture on the black and white picture on the bottom there and the little book, The Korean Pentecost, is regarding one of the most significant events in Korean church history, which is the Pyongyang Revival. Pyongyang is in modern North Korea. It's one of the most atheistic, most uh, harshest country to cr harshest places against Christianity, oppressive places. But yet, there was a time when Pyongyang was known as the Jerusalem of the East, that there were revival meetings. And the revival meetings started before 1907, but the big revival started in 1907, where literally tens of thousands of people will come from all over Korea, traveling by foot, 70 miles by foot, they would come for these Bible meetings. They would have Bible conferences. So they would have a conference like this. They would come from all over Korea to hear the Word of God, to hear the gospel, to pray together. And the, the Holy Spirit fell in such a way of a repentance, repentance for racial prejudice from the missionaries. And uh, they were praying, and God moved. And if you've ever seen Korean prayer, I don't know how you guys if you've experienced this, but Koreans are known for loud praying. <laughs> and you know why they do that? It's because they're, they're trying to, in some ways, duplicate what happened in Pyongyang Revival when the Holy Spirit fell and people all together were just crying out their repentance in one voice. And the missionaries talked about it as this beautiful harmony of voices, like a symphony of, of prayers uttered to God in holiness. And so... Pyongyang revival in 1907 to 1910. And the, one of the reasons why the revival ended in 1910, you can say, is because of a uh, persecution. Next slide. In 1910, the Japanese, or, you know, uh, I love the Japanese people. Our church supports uh, many missionaries to Japan. And uh, I have a great affection for Japan and Japanese people. But in 1910, Imperial Japan had this vision to conquer Asia and, in fact, try to conquer the world. So that there's a little picture here of the Japanese, Imperial Japanese, planting their flag in Asia, knocking off all powers, the Chinese, the Koreans, everyone. And they took over Korea, and they were trying to take over China as well. And so, from 1910 to 1945, Korea lived under the occupation of Japan. And the reason why, that this is the context here, but in 1919, there's something called the Samil movement. Right? Samil movement. Samil in Korean mean, literally means 3-1, which stands for March 1st, 1919, 
there were these gathering of 33 people, and it was not just 33 people. There was a, a lot of other people, but 33 people signed what is equivalent to like a declaration of independence, that we are declaring independence from Japanese rule, and they signed this uh, document knowing that this would probably mean their death. So 15 of the 33 signers were Christians. And the reason why something like this is important, because remember, Koreans thought Christianity was a foreign religion, not good for Korea. But through things like this, that the ones, the people who was defending Korea, Korean independence, were the Christians. fighting the oppressors, and so therefore, Koreans became more sympathetic to Christianity through, through testimonies like this of these heroic people. And in 1938, even though Japan had occupied Korea for a long time, they started to, in 1937 and 38, particularly 1937, Japan declares war on China, and they want to progress into China and so what do they do with Korea? They need Korea to be on the Japanese side. So they impose strict Japanese culture upon Koreans. My parents speak fluent Japanese to this day because they were born in 1930s. And you had to speak Japanese. You were given Japanese names. You could not worship Korean religion or foreign religions. You had to worship in the Shinto shrine. You had to be religiously Japanese. You had to learn the Japanese language. There was an, an effort. And during this time, over 3,000 Christian leaders were imprisoned for professing their faith and rejecting to bow down the, the little wooden structure there is the Shinto shrine. And whenever they had smaller versions of the shrine pass by in the street, everybody would have to stop, direct their attention to the shrine and bow out of reverence for the emperor of Japan as the deity, the god on earth. And the Koreans would do that because they didn't want to be jailed. But there was a group of Christians who refused to do that, saying that is the breaking of the first and second commandment. And they would refuse to bow. They would be imprisoned. And some of them will be killed in prison. And one of those people that were killed in prison was in 1944, a man named uh, Gichal Chu, Reverend Gichal Chu, was a Presbyterian minister. He was in prison many times. He was the person who galvanized the Christians in resisting the Japanese Shinto shrine worship. He was, in fact, the younger brother of my great-grandfather. So I knew of him. My, my mother is a Chu. <laughs> And this man was the, I'll use the Korean word, Jagan Harabuji, great uncle to my mother. So I grew up hearing many stories of this man, of this legacy. And the picture that you see of those few people in white and some ladies as well, these were people. Uh, Reverend Chu was killed by lethal injection in 1944 because he would refuse to compromise even after much torture. And his faith, if, if I were to say, uh, I'm going to show you two people, who are the most important people in Korean church history? There's a few different names that I've, I've already said, but I would say Reverend Chu, he galvanized a kind of faith, this strong iron-like faith to be faithful unto death. Why do Koreans, why are there are so many Korean churches? There are many reasons. There are Robert Germain Thomas and all these people, but Reverend Gi Chul Chu, Ju Gi Chul, is one of these men. 
And then these people called the prison saints, these were people in prison. They did this. They were as resistant to uh, being forced into a false religion as Reverend Chu, but they actually were, some of these people were supposed to be executed. I forgot the dates in my mind here, but um, they were supposed to be executed on a certain date. Let me see if I have that date here. Um, I don't have it written here, but uh, they were supposed to be executed on, let's say, August. I'll, I'm just making up a date. So they were supposed to be executed on August 18th, and then Koreans, the war ended on August 16th. So I kind of forgot when the war ended, but <laughs> you could adjust it. But it was their, their execution date was like two days after the end of the war, or the war ended two days before, and they had ended up being set free. They would have been martyrs. So they were called the living martyrs. And they are the people who went and testified to the work of God in strengthening them through this adversity. Next slide. So you would think after the Korean, uh, after World War II is over and Japanese occupation is finished, and there was this great celebration in the city of Seoul. A million people, I don't have the picture of it, but in 19, 1945, a million people went into the streets of Seoul celebrating the end of the war and end of Japanese occupation. And you would think, hallelujah, now we are living in freedom, but no. What came was even worse, the Korean War. So after the Japanese left, who, did, who came? North Korean communists. Communism came. And there was a battle between people who loved freedom and people who wanted to embrace the communistic state. And one of the harshest communistic state is in North Korea. And so here there was this battle. And so the Korean War is from 1950 to 1953. And in 1950, there was another man, a beautiful man, not because of his looks, but because of his character, Reverend Yang Won Son. And it's interesting here. His last name is Son, S-O-N. It says he was killed, and he was killed by the communists because he did not flee when everybody was fleeing to the south. He did not flee because he was a pastor to lepers. He pastored in a leper colony, and he would refuse to leave his people, stay with them. And when the communists came, they said, Are you Reverend Son? Do you renounce Christ? No. Boom killed him. He was killed for his faith. But the amazing thing about this man is a couple of years before this, when the communists were coming down and there were these movements of communist youth that was trying to purify the culture, and these communist youth captured two of Reverend Son's sons. And actually, I think it was, one was captured, the oldest son was captured because he was a Christian leader as a youth. They were both teenagers. And these communist youth came and captured him and said, you are, you know, you are Westerner, you are, you know, against the, you know, socialist society. And so he, they were going to kill him. And then the, the younger brother came, please don't kill my brother, don't kill my brother. <laughs> he has to take care of the family. He's the oldest son. Kill me instead, the younger brother said. I'm a Christian too. And this communist youth said, why you? You're worse than your older brother. I'm going to kill both of you. And he executed these two young sons. And as the communists were being pushed back, that young youth was actually captured by those who were fighting for freedom. And he was captured and he brought, was brought to trial. And Reverend Son pleaded with this with the people for the, the life of this young man. This young man took my two sons. I have no sons. I want to adopt this young man as my son. So Reverend Son adopted the person who killed his two sons. 
and raise them as a Christian. And I heard later on he became a Christian pastor. There's a book. I, ha I have this book. I haven't read, read through it all, but it's a cheesy title, but, you know, you can... This is actually from Amazon. <laughs> you can get this from Amazon. The Atomic Bomb of Love. In 1950, if you think about it, you know, that's the atomic age. The 19, you know, atomic bomb was dropped in 1945, and so everybody's, like, afraid of atomic power. And this book is written, so there is something more powerful than the atomic bomb. It is the Christian love demonstrated in the life of people like Reverend Yang Wan Son. And if you know people who know Korean history, if you were to ask, who are the two most prominent Korean Christians, these two, if they don't name these two, they don't know Korean history. I don't know a lot of people myself, but I know these two guys. And I can vouch that uh, I've seen Important Korean church figures, and always these two are the first two people that they talk about. I grew up hearing about them, knowing about them. And why are there so many Christians, Korean Christians today? It's because of the missionaries, yes, but it's because of the faith of people like these. In 1950s and 1960s, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world, if not the poorest, immediately after the Korean War, where millions of Koreans perished, it was one of the poorest countries in the world. Now, Korea is the 10th biggest economy in the world. Shipbuilding, you know, you guys all know about cell phones and, you know, flat screen TVs and uh, in Samsung, LG, and Hyundai, and Kia, and all those things. And there's an article in Wikipedia called Miracle on the Han River. So K Korean economy is a miracle. <laughs> Rags to riches. Out of the ashes, a world-class economy was built. And there are many reasons for that. But I would argue that for people to rise out of such dire situation, what is the power, internal power at drive. You know, was it just greed? Was it, you know, materialism? There was a spiritual power at play in Christianity and its influence in Korean history and even in the Korean economy, giving hope when it was so dark. What gives people hope in the midst of the darkest situation? What is the religion that teaches from death to life. And it is Christianity. So out of the ashes, the growth of the Korean church. Ten of the 20 largest churches in the world are Korean. This is a picture of uh, sort of these red-lit crosses all over Seoul. And in the United States, and, and the bottom one, I don't know what church it is. I just got it from Google. But uh, there are these mega churches. So if you're, if you're not over 10,000 people, they don't even consider you a mega church in Korea. You know, here, if you're like 2,000, that's, that's the mark of a mega church. But in Korea, you have to be in the tens of thousands. There are many churches that have over 10,000 people coming for morning service, early morning service at 5.30 or 4.30 in the morning. Many, some churches have multiple morning services from 4.30, 5.30, 6.30. In the United States, that there are over 4,000 Korean churches. I heard recently it's 4,400. There's one Korean church for every about 500 Koreans in the United States. It's a, a very saturated population. Next slide. But moving into our current situation, you know, there's a verse in Judges 2.10. It says, and all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. Joshua has passed away. There was Moses, and there was Joshua who went into the promised land, and then they had passed away. 
And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the works that he had done. And the judges is a time of just chaos. Next slide. So remember verse 7, 27, and that they would seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, yet he is not actually far from each one of us. So why are there are so many Korean churches? Because of this legacy, there is a history of why. But, you know, one of the problems is, you know, I was talking to a missionary from Brazil recently, and Brazil is another place in the world where Presbyterianism is thriving. There are only really two places in the world where Presbyterians has, has really grown and captured the masses, and it is Korea and Brazil. But he was talking to me, and as we were talking and we were discussing some of the current issues that's going on in Korea, and we both, he said to me, he says, you and I both know the secret. <laughs> And he said, we had a glorious history, but we are on the decline. We've gotten fat. We've gotten proud. We've become self-sufficient. And that's why Many second generation or young people see a lot of the problems. Some of the beautiful things that were in Korean Christianity, this faith, it wasn't about being Korean. It was about being a Christian. This faith, this beautiful love, the love of Christ demonstrated in a culture a life of prayer and dependence upon God to raise us out of death, out of the ashes. We've gotten fat. We've become complacent. We've forgotten. We've become proud. Next slide. I mean, there are many positive things to our current situation, so I don't want to be a downer and just condemn us for being proud, but I do think this is a real issue today of where we need to get back to, the, the dependence upon God, to hope in God, not to think that we can do it, but it is God who is at work in us, that we are desperately needy for God. You know, what's going to happen with the second generation? What's going to happen with the third generation? What's happening with the EM? Why is our church so small? Why is our church going through so many problems? We need to get back to God. To hope in God, we need to get back to the gospel. And we need to humble ourselves to seek the Lord. Likewise, you are younger. Be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with Humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. You know, I, um, I'm a third-generation Korean-American Presbyterian minister or I'm a third-generation Presbyterian minister. My father was a pastor. He was a Presbyterian minister. My grandfather was a pastor. He was a Presbyterian minister. My great-grandfather was a Presbyterian elder. And uh, I need to be wrapping up here, but to say that as I was growing up in the United States, I had this rich legacy in my own family, but I didn't appreciate it. To be honest, I only saw the problems. 
I only saw the problems in my father. I only saw the problems in his church. I didn't really appreciate the roots of where this faith came from. And when I started to learn some of the history, I realized there are people of great convictions, people who lived a beautiful life in the Lord. And, you know, I would say, why are there so many hypocrites in the church? Why are there so many? You know what? Christianity is so strong. If it wasn't, all the hypocrites in the church would have killed the church. Hypocrisy has not killed the church. Why? Because there is a genuine root. If the church is indeed filled of hypocrites, it will die out in 10 years. But let me tell you, there is a root that is real, that is good. This is not being a Korean Christian. It is understanding that in every culture, God's hand. You need to learn the story so that you can appreciate it, build on it, not to idolize it, but to come to the faith, my faith in the God of the universe who knows everything, who made everything. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to consider our context. And though some of us here might not be from a Korean context, but Lord, I do pray that I just want to take some time to just celebrate what you have done in history in all people, in many different nations, but particularly in Korea, we thank you for the work that you have done there. That out of the ashes, out of darkness, what seemed impossible for missionaries to reach this hermit people, this darkened people, living in darkness without the knowledge of the Bible, without the knowledge of God, and you broke through with people who are willing to give their lives for the sake of the gospel. Thank you. Thank you for that witness, for their witness, for the strength of their faith. And grant us strength, grant us hope that we too might rise out of the darkness, rise out of the ashes by your Holy Spirit working in us, holding on to the true gospel being the church of the living God. And so strengthen us now. We look to you. You are our God. You are the creator of the universe and the hope of the world. In you we place our hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
gracious to you, the Lord turned his face towards you and gave you peace. And amen, amen, amen. And amen, amen, amen. Let's proclaim those words. And amen, and amen, amen, and amen, amen, amen.
just the words that we've heard uh, from Pastor Billy and just walking us through Korean church history is one of the connecting points that we make this morning is that in the midst of tremendous persecution, struggle, hopelessness, dire situations, Lord, the root of Christ, the good news, the hope of life after death, continue. Father God, this morning we'd be lying if we didn't confess, God, that we are living in confusing times. Facing persecution. We're not as poor as Korea was after the war. And yet, hopelessness continues. Darkness, struggle, conflict, bitterness. And Father God, this morning, as we just closed with this song saying, Amen, Amen, we want to affirm once again that the answer is none other than Christ. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our God the Father who sent his one and only to die for us on the cross, the fellowship and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we remember our history and as we remember the root and, and the center of Christ in it and through it all, giving us strength and forever.